This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 1027, recorded on July 20, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Not too long ago, Daniel, there were rumblings about perhaps having mpox outbreaks. Has that ever materialized? Just just a few here or there. We haven't seen any major outbreaks yet, so we'll keep you know, an the, eye on that. The models all said we were going to have a big outbreak. You can't trust the models. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, actually, I I would worry about August just to kind of let everyone just sort of speaking about, you know, what I know about behavior. We'll, we'll see what happens next month. We're almost there. Okay. Um, and I don't know if you noticed, you know, so we just recorded this week in parasitism. I'm That's wearing right. my Giardia bow tie. That figured in, in part of the episode, <laughs> didn't it? Maybe it was appropriate. Yeah. But let us get right into it uh, with my quotation. It's when we start working together that the real healing takes place. It's when we start spilling our sweat and not our blood. And that's David Hume, actually one of my favorite philosophers when I was uh, uh, coming up through the ranks uh, studying philosophy um, out at University of Colorado Boulder. Um, I will just give people a little background here. We're actually, we're still seeing a trickle of norovirus cases. I guess we can't call it winter vomiting. It's now going to be summer vomiting disease. Uh, a number of Babesia cases. Um, COVID is just sort of this low rumble in the outpatient. Um, you know, we've got a few patients here or there that are getting admitted. Um, but we, we are starting to see maybe a little more in our urgent cares, a little more reports in our camp environment. So uh, just sort of give people a heads up there. And malaria. Oh, my gosh. We are now up to eight cases. Um, another case was just diagnosed uh, on Tuesday in Florida. RSV. I uh, wanted to share the news here. Um, really a lot going on in RSV. Um, and the FDA approved, approved a new drug to treat RSV in babies and toddlers. On January 17th, the FDA approved Bayfortis or Nursevimab. I like that. Nursevimab, right? Mm -hmm. For the prevention of RSV, lower respiratory tract disease in neonates and infants born during or entering their first RSV season and in children up to 24 months of age who remain vulnerable to severe RSV disease through their second RSV season, right? So uh, a lot of a lot of ideas that this is going to be for everyone under two, right? So sort of a thought of maybe we'll charge a little bit less and get it out to more folks. So Nursevimab binds to the pre-fusion confirmation of the RSV fusion protein, um, i.e. it binds to the site at which the virus would attach to a cell, um, effectively neutralizing the virus. It has a modified um, FC region extending the half-life of the drugs. This is going to last for the season. Um, one dose of Bayfortis administered as a single intramuscular injection prior to or during RSV season may provide protection during that season. And the data suggests the reduced risk of medically attended RSV lower respiratory tract infection um, about 70 to 75 percent relative to placebo. Uh, we'll mention this is the second monoclonal after palavizumab for preventing RSV in young children. Um, but as I mentioned, what about the cost? We we did mention that palavizumab is not used a lot because it's thousands of dollars a dose. Well, the price per course is estimated to be six six hundred dollars in the U.S. and three hundred dollars in Europe um, versus those thousands of dollars for Palavizumab. Do, do you think maybe the maker of Palavizumab <clears throat> could lower the price? You know, one of the interesting issues might be the indications, right? So this is a very broad indication. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, yeah, I'm sort of curious what's going to happen with the Palavizumab. So can they also be used therapeutically? 
You know, the uh, the approval was for prevention. Um, okay. That's an interesting question. Same, yeah. same yeah. with par- pavilizumab. It's also preventative. Yeah, they're both preventive. But, you know, interesting. Um, yeah, you know, looking at, you know, be interesting to look at trials. What if you jump in? Can you jump in quick enough um, and make a difference here? So if, if, if an infant has RSV, what do you do then? How do you treat it? So in most cases, it's really supportive care. Um, okay. Give them oxygen, um, but this is—I mean—you raise an interesting point. I mean, from a mechanism point of view, it seems like this could potentially have an impact if you can get it in there early enough. Well, you'd have to do a trial to see if how many days you have, right? I think that's it. You, you got to do the science, right? I mean, I know yeah. that's you know. <laughs> so, now, uh, but you really, really do because you know, does it work, and when does it work, and whom does it work? I mean, you need to know. So remind us where we are with vaccines uh, for RSV. Uh, so RSV, we've got the two vaccines, right? We've got the vac- vaccination option for those 16 over. Remember, right. that's the high-risk people, shared decision-making if you're just there by age. Um, and we also have the vaccination in the last trimester of a pregnant individual so that then the, the newborn is got protected. It. Okay. Moving into COVID, uh, we, we, got a, we got a lot of questions about this. Actually, people were asking about this issue on the last live stream um, uh, that I was on. Um, and uh, the article, Transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in Free-Ranging White-Tailed Deer in the United States, was published in Nature Communications. Uh, got, a, got a little social media and regular media attention um, and suggested that here in the U.S., SARS-CoV-2 was transmitted from humans to deer more than 100 times, mutated, and then was potentially transmitted back to humans in three cases. People like their deer, don't they? They do. You got you to stop playing with the deer so much. All right. Once something is tucked away, uh, you know, as, as, as truth, it's pretty hard to correct it, even when you have actually a lot of data to correct it. Uh, so the paper, Omicron subvariant BA.5 efficiently infects lung cells, was recently published in Nature Communications. Need I bother? Is anyone going to listen, Vincent? Have, have everyone decided well? <laughs> we yeah, previously, dis- yeah. <laughs> previously yeah. discussed some work suggesting that the SARS-CoV-2 Omicron subvariants BA1 and BA2 exhibit reduced lung cell infection relative to previously circulating SARS-CoV-2 variants. Um, but here the investigators show that the spike protein of BA5, that's an Omicron, exhibits increased cleavage at the S12 site, and they suggest that this drives cell-cell fusion and lung cell entry with higher efficiently efficiency than its counterparts from BA1, BA2. They argue that increased lung cell entry depends on a particular mutation, um, H69 delta V70 delta, and is associated with efficient replication of BA5. BA5 in cultured lung cells similar to the early variants. Further, BA5 replicates in the lungs of female Balb C mice and the nasal cavity of female ferrets with higher efficiency than BA1. Dan, you remember very recently you talked about a study in Hong Kong on, on pathogenicity of uh, Omicron. Do you remember which, which variant they were looking at there? That's actually, I have to say, when I was when I was talking about this, it sort of made me think about, do we need to sort of tease out? Do we have enough data to say? Yeah, because people just broadly say, oh, Omicron, yeah, right. it's it's mild. Um, and then we've sort of said, actually, if you if you look at, you know, you're not seeing that. Um, and I guess now we might be sort of asking, which Omicron are you talking about when you say it's mild? Which Omicron are we talking about when you point out that it's not mild? Yes. Um, I think the the, you know, the one consistent thing is what makes Omicron mild? Immunity. Mm-hmm. Early clearly, treatment. Clearly, yeah. 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 All right. As clearly as we say that, I'm, I'm not sure. But okay. <laughs> not sure people are getting the message. Um, well, well yeah. interestingly, I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah, in, no, that, please do. in that paper that you just uh, referenced, uh, let me, I think I have it here. Hang on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's Nature Communication, Omicron subvariant BA5 efficiently infects lung cells. Uh, the, the subvariants BA1 and 2 exhibit reduced lung cell infection, which may account for their reduced pathogenicity. Yeah, do you see that? That's crazy. Even right there in their intro. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. Okay. 
All right. The article, COVID-19 Scent Dog Research Highlights and Synthesis During the Pandemic of December 2019 through April 2023, was published in the Journal of Osteopathic Medicine. And they reported, um, they looked at a bunch of studies that analyzed um, how dogs might detect uh, covid uh, in asymptomatic people, it's interesting. I'm going to say COVID, right? Because we, we've tried to point out they're not sniffing the virus. There's something about the people. They're able to detect asymptomatic people. They're able to detect folks with long COVID, I like that. Um, and they're even able to, defect, to uh, detect folks with uh, some of the new COVID um, due to variants. Among the 29 studies they looked at, um, in the field studies, the dogs performed comparable to PCR tests with, are you ready for this? Sensitivity ranging from 68.6 to 95.9%, um, with three of the six ranging between 92 and 95.9. Uh, the specificities um, ranged from 75 to 90. 9.9 with three of the six ranging between 95.1 <laughs> and 99.9. So diff different dogs, but um, all the dog sniffing results occurred. Are you ready for this? In a matter of seconds to no more than 15 minutes, not four days, not have I gotten that test result? I got it done on Monday and it's Saturday. No, minutes to uh, 15 minutes at most, much faster than other forms of testing. And yes, if you look up this article, lots of cute dog pictures. So the bottom line is that technology is for the dogs. <laughs> the dogs win. <laughs> I, you know, I saw this title, COVID-19 cent. I thought it was 19 cents and it meant it was a cheap. <laughs> <laughs> How much is that? That'll be COVID-19 cents. Right. Um, <laughs> all right. I wanted to throw this out here because this is something that I think has been sort of bouncing around. I sort of want to, you know, hopefully I'm trying to generate some uh, angry emails. But here's a question I've got, you know, ventilation, transmission. Is SARS-CoV-2 airborne or enhanced droplet, right? Because different medical centers use different terminology. Um I'll have to say at, at one medical center where I do some uh, clinical time, uh, they actually have introduced something called enhanced droplet. They put a sticker on the door. The door stays shut. Um, the person is not in a negative pressure room. Uh, all the people that are going to take care of the individual, they gown, they glove, they put on an N95. Sort of this question, does every admitted patient need a negative pressure room or can we just close the room, close the door and wear N95s? Um, other places where I work, I think this is funny, they've got these red um, isolation, um, airborne precautions. But they're doing the same thing. They're just shutting the door. They're not putting them all in negative pressure rooms. So I'm just sort of curious. Uh, you know, I'm hoping this triggers some emotional email responses. Um, one is, I think you got to be honest, right? If you're if you're doing enhanced droplet and you're just shutting a door, that is not a negative pressure room with 15 air exchanges per hour and negative pressure relative to the hallway with particularly an antechamber. So what's pointing that out, folks. What, what's an enhanced droplet? Daniel. So <laughs> it's actually this, this new approach where they basically have said, okay, um, we're going to shut the door. Everyone taking care of the patient is going to wear an N95, mm -hmm. but we're not going to require that every single uh, COVID patient be in an individual negative pressure um, chamber. I see. So they're all in the same area. They're just, they're regular. You can put them on a regular floor. You can put them in a regular room. You just keep them either cohorted by themselves and you keep that door shut and everyone going in and out is practicing this sort of enhanced hygiene. Okay. All right. COVID active vaccination immunity. Um, perhaps a little controversy. You're going to like this one, Vincent, I mm -hmm. tell you ahead of time. T-cell immunity against severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 measured by an interferon gamma release assay is strongly associated with patient outcomes in vaccinated persons hospitalized with Delta or Omicron variants published in JID. So these are the results of a prospective longitudinal study including vaccinated patients hospitalized with Delta and Omicron SARS-CoV-2 variants. Um, trimeric SIgG antibodies and SARS-CoV-2 SARS-CoV-2 T-cell responses were measured using a specific quantitative interferon gamma release assay. Primary outcomes were all-cause 28-day mortality or need for ICU admission. 
Um, maybe I should talk a little bit about how you do these kind of an assay. So basically, you're going to draw an individual's blood. Um, you're going to actually uh, spin it. So you've got that Buffy coat with your white cells. In there are going to be your T cells. And then you're actually going to go ahead and do a stimulation to see um, how much interferon gamma is released from those, um, those T cells. Um, so the whole idea of a quantitative interferon gamma release assay for looking at SARS-CoV-2 T cell response doesn't seem quite as hard as people seem to think uh, assessing T cell T cell responses need be. Okay, so here they are. Bets are in, and what did they find? Is it the T cells? Is it the B cells? Is it both? Well. Of 181 individuals, um, remember these are vaccinated folks, 87.3% had detectable SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. 50.8% 50 50 showed SARS-CoV-2 specific T cell responses. And 48% had both responses. Um, patients who died within 28 days or admitted to ICU were less likely to have both unspecific and specific T cell responses in the IGRA. In the adjusted analysis for the entire cohort, having both T cell and antibody responses at admission, um, 0.16, so an 84% reduced hazard of 28-day mortality or ICU admission. So, Tanya, when are they taking the, samp the bloods here? Do you know offhand? At admission. I'm surprised. So the person that it shows up at the yeah. door and they do it. So they're they're being admitted for COVID, obviously, right? Yes. So it's interesting that only half of them had both responses. I'm very surprised at that. What about you? So there's an interesting idea here, and you know maybe this is an immune deep dive, but you know we've always talked about like okay, so antibodies take a certain amount of time, um, T cells take three or four days, but let's kind of go into the nuance. Adaptive immune cells actually undergo evolutionary pressure. Mm -hmm. So one person's T cell repertoire might be a little bit different than another person's T cell repertoire. So the idea here, when you kind of go into some of this stuff, is the idea that certain people, and don't worry, I've got a cool study coming up on this, might actually have a significant amount, we'll call it a public T cell um, pre population mm -hmm. ready to respond to SARS-CoV-2 and other coronaviruses. So the idea here is maybe what we're seeing um, is maybe certain people, when they get that proper vaccination, are getting this um, sustained T-cell memory and response. Or, as we'll talk about a little bit later, maybe certain people with the right HLA subtype, right, MHC yeah. molecules might be sort of primed. Yeah, it's a possibility. Are they using a mix of peptides here, right? The, the covering whatever, the whole spike or something like that? Do you know? Um, that I don't. Because yeah. I'm sure they're not just using a single peptide because that could be a problem, right? That there. could skew. Yeah, that could skew things. All right. But I thought it was interesting. I mean, we're starting to see, well, in this paper, we're seeing like just having the antibodies alone, that's not enough if you've got that T cell. But but here, you know, we say it's admission, right? Most people getting admitted for COVID, it's during the second week. They should have had enough time to have a T cell response. Yeah, sure. So it's the people who, and half the people, right? 50.8% have a specific T cell response. 492 do don't. So yeah. half the folks here in the second week and the T cells are not kicking in. Yeah, I would be interested to know if you waited a bit longer, if they would, right? Yeah, yeah. Is it, again, is it timing? Is it a binary? So, yeah. yeah. Okay. And they do a nice figure, too, as a really nice, you know, probability of event-free survival, and they follow that um, over time. And you really see, you really see this separate, you know, out over time. And, boy, the folks that have the, uh, the IGRA positive as well as the, um, the immune, the B cell uh, IgG response really doing much better. Well, this is good to see data that support what we've been suggesting and others. I mean, Alessandro Sate and Shane Crotty saying the T cells are, John Wary, the T cells are important. Now we see some data starting to support that, right? I, I like the way you word that, right? Because that's science, right? I mean, science is we're waiting for the data. We're willing to, uh, you know, modify, yeah. um, you know, our ideas. And so uh, this has been a big discussion for a long time. How important are the neutralizing antibodies? How important are the non-neutralizing antibodies? How important are the memory B cells? How important are the T cells? And here we're really seeing um, a huge impact of having an appropriate T cell response. 
All right, moving into COVID, the early viral upper respiratory non-hypoxic phase. Um, this is for some, the first week of viral symptoms. But what about those people who have no symptoms? Is, is that fair? <laughs> well, it may not be fair, but there might be an explanation. So the article, a common allele of HLA is associated with asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection recently published in Nature. So this study enrolled 29,947 individuals for whom high-resolution HLA genotyping data was available in a smartphone-based study designed to track COVID-19 symptoms and outcomes. Um, their discovery cohort, um, N equals 1,428, comprised unvaccinated individuals who reported a positive test result for SARS-CoV-2. They tested for association of five HLA loci, that's a human leukocyte antigen, um, with disease course and identified a strong association between HLA B1501 and having an asymptomatic infection observed in two independent cohorts, uh, suggesting that this genetic association is due to pre-existing T-cell immunity. They show that T cells from pre-pandemic samples from individuals carrying HLA-B1501 were reactive to the immunodominant SARS-CoV-2-S derived peptide, and again, N-Q-K-L-I-A-N-Q-F. Um, the majority of the reactive T cells displayed a memory phenotype, that's important to think about, were highly polyfunctional and were cross-reactive to a peptide derived from seasonal coronaviruses. Um, the crystalline structure, I mean, they've got some great figures, so you got to go look at this. The crystalline structure of HLA-B1501 peptide complexes demonstrates that these peptides, NQK, LIA, NQF, and another one from OC43 and HKU, one CoV share a similar ability to be stabilized and presented by HLA-B1501. And finally, they show that the structural similarity of the peptide underpins T-cell cross-reactivity of high affinity public T-cell receptors, providing the molecular basis for this HLA-B1501 mediated pre-existing immunity. So I'm going to put this in a little bit of context because there's a lot of immunology here. Um, a significant association of HLA-B1501 with asymptomatic infection, right? So that's, you're basically genotyping people. And if you've got this HLA-B1501, um, you uh, have an associate with asymptomatic infection um, after they adjust for a bunch of variables, odds ratio of 2.4, so about two and a half times. Um, but then there are strong additive effects for associated genotypes. So individuals that have two copies were more than eight times as likely to remain asymptomatic than individuals carrying other genotypes. Um, so we see a, a odds ratio of 8.58. So overall, about 20% of individuals, so one in five of the individuals who remained asymptomatic after infection, carry the HLA-B1501, compared with 9% among patients reporting symptoms. So the HLAs present on the surface of the infected cell, the pep viral peptides, and then the T cells recognize that and kill that cell. That's the basis for HLA, right? So what we're saying yeah. is, if you have a particular HLA, it, it's really good at presenting a particular peptide that's recognized by the T cells that these people have, but not everybody has those T cells, right? Exactly. Or the MHC, because the MHC, right? So this is the MHC. This on is the MHC, cells, yes. But yeah. Yeah. So really interesting. It's this whole evolutionary impact. Because I was trying to tease this out. So there's an evolutionary impact on adaptive immunity. Um, but since these also have a memory phenotype, um, there may also be a priming from OC43 or HKU1. Mm -hmm. Right. Or, you know, now as we'll probably see in the future, there may even be a priming from prior infection and vaccination. Sure. Yeah. Interesting sure. stuff. No, I think this is very, we're actually going to do this on TWIV tomorrow. It's, uh, it's uh, a really good study. I like it very much. Oh, this is great. Well, I will be listening. And what do we do? Whether you have, uh, well, whether you have this or not, if you are symptomatic and high risk, number one, Paxlovid, number two, Remdesivir, number three, Malnupiravir, 
convalescent plasma in certain situations, um, avoid doing those harmful and useful things. And just a reminder on the small print in the CDC isolation recommendations, uh, as I mentioned, we, we are seeing folks that are testing positive, they're symptomatic, and the question comes up, what am I supposed to do? Can I just go to work? It's just COVID. <laughs> Well, what is the CDC that updated the recommendations in May? Uh, what is May 2023 recommendations? And here are just to run through them. Um, if you test positive for COVID-19, stay home for at least five days and isolate from others in your home. Um, you are likely most infectious during those first five days. And that, that's really the science. I mean, 85, 90% of transmission is happening in those first five days. Uh, recommending that you wear a high quality mask if you must be around others at home or in public. I mean, some folks have to. Um, do not go to places where you can't wear that mask. Um, try to separate from others as much as possible using a separate bathroom. Take steps to improve the ventilation, right? Keep those fans on, open those windows. I'm not sure how exciting that is in 95 degree heat. Uh, don't share personal household items like cup, towels, and utensils. You shouldn't do that anyway. And then if you have no symptoms, you may end isolation after day five. And that's where everyone stops reading. Then the small print. What is the small print? <laughs> Regardless of when you end isolation, until at least day 11, avoid being around people who are more likely to get very sick from COVID-19. Remember to wear a high-quality mask when indoors, around others at home and in public, and do not go places where you're unable to wear a mask until you're able to discontinue masking. Um, and then there's actually a few other things that are sort of thrown in. Um, all right, let's move on to the second week, right? Some people feel better. And then about probably 10, 20%, uh, particularly of our high-risk individuals, will start having a tough time. That second week, the early inflammatory or cytokine storm phase, steroids in the right person, anticoagulation. Um, but what about anticoagulation? There's some guidelines out there, but what are people doing? So we've talked repeatedly about the guidelines to help with decisions around anticoagulation in patients hospitalized with moderate to severe COVID during this early inflammatory phase. But what are people actually doing? The article, National Trends in Anticoagulation Therapy for COVID-19 Hospitalized Adults in the United States, Analysis of the National COVID cohort collaboration was recently published in JID. Here, the authors use the National COVID Cohort Collaborative, conducted a retrospective cohort study to assess anticoagulation use patterns and identify factors associated with therapeutic anticoagulation. And in a nutshell, among 162,842 hospitalized COVID-19 patients, 64% received anticoagulation, 24% received therapeutic anticoagulation. Therapeutic anticoagulation use declined from 32% in 2020 to 12% in 2022, especially after December 2021. So what are the current ASH guidelines and what are we seeing here? Well, early in the pandemic, the advice out of China was not to use anticoagulation at all. Well, this guidance rapidly changed and we moved to low quality evidence suggesting to use full dose anticoagulation for four patients, therapeutic dose for critical patients with concerns about bleeding risks outweighing benefits. All of this was couched in the low quality evidence we were working with and uh, recommendations to assess each individual patient for their risk of benefit. Uh, now in this study, a few things stood out. Two thirds were getting anticoagulation and actually surprisingly one third got no anticoagulation. Um, I have to say, that's sort of interesting because this was the, the COVID wars. It was a great New York Times piece where um, really a lot of us in the trenches quickly realized that not using anticoagulation, the majority of our patients were having significant um, thrombotic embolic complications. So sort of surprising that still about a third of patients are not getting anticoagulation at all. Um, the other was that in contrast to the ASH guidance, where you're saying the risk of bleeding uh, would suggest using a lower dose, sicker, critically ill patients were the ones more likely to get therapeutic anticoagulation, sort of going against um, what evidence we did have. Um, and also the association with not using full dose anticoagulation with Omicron and in patients that have been vaccinated. All right. 
remdesivir. Remember, we've talked a little bit about that. And actually, we have an update on remdesivir. I wasn't sure where to put this, um, but they have updated um, the approval. So um, this approval is now for use in patients with severe renal impairment based upon results from a phase one study, as well as results from the phase three red pine trial that demonstrated the pharmacokinetics and safety profile of Vecalori or remdesivir. So basically for a while, we've been talking about using remdesivir in individuals with severe renal impairment, including those on dialysis. And here it is now approved. So no longer stepping out outside of the, um, the product insert, the directions, uh, you can use remdesivir independent of renal function, also no drug-drug interaction. So again, really a, a great option uh, when we have access. And all right, let us move into COVID, the late phase past long COVID. Um, I'm going to suggest people spend a little time. Um, I was going to say those interested, but everyone should be interested in long COVID. The review article, The Immunology of Long COVID, was recently published in Nature Reviews Immunology. Um, and really, in many ways, this is the greatest hit, uh, greatest hits of theories behind the cause of long COVID. And in table one, they, they lay them out. Um, I have to say, just to qualify, like people tweet this out, look, they finally admitted. I'm like, they're just sort of listing the theories. So um, yeah, take a deep breath there. But okay, what are the hypothetical mechanisms underlying long COVID pathogenesis? So so one, and I think we we definitely see this, organ damage in targeted tissue, right? Um, there are folks um, who have loss of pulmonary function. Uh, and so, you know, really, you know, people who have uh, cardiac uh, damage that occurs. So there, there certainly can be damage in targeted tissues. Another hypothetical mechanism is persistent virus or antigen reservoirs. Another is reactivation of Epstein-Barr or other latent viruses, maybe even activation of endogenous viruses. Um, changes in inflammatory activation, systemic immunity, immune subsets and their transcription profiles. Uh, the theory of vascular endothelial activation or dysfunction. Uh, the hypothesis around a role for mast cell activation. Um, hypothesis around an autoimmune basis, and that might be autoantibodies or T-cells, um, and a hypothesis around a microbiota dysbiosis. Now, there are 166 references, um, so it's really a great way to sort of look through and see what all the different research are on the different theories. Um, there's a really nice table three with a list of different trials with their rationale and where they're being conducted. Um, but I should just point out for everyone who's been tweeting this out there, this is a list of theories. So, I was just going to say a lot of hypotheses there, Daniel. Yeah, no, and that's that's what they are. And, yeah. you know, we do need hypothesis, but remember, there's a big difference between a hypothesis yeah. and, yeah, what we actually yeah, know. Absolutely. All right, low and middle income countries. I, I want people not to just be thinking about the wealthier, resource rich areas. Um, and as I continue to say, no one is safe until everyone is safe. Um, here we are getting near the end of July, finishing our May, June, and July Foundation International Medical Relief of Children fundraiser, um, trying to get up to that uh, that donation of $20,000 from Parasites Without Borders to FEMRIC. So uh, pause your recording, go to ParasitesWithoutBorders.com, click on that donate button. Time for your questions for Daniel. You can send them to daniel at microbe.tv. Alice writes, I am 79, reasonably healthy with SVT. I had a bivalent booster in October 22, which I think was my fifth shot, and wonder whether I should have another bivalent now or wait until the fall for the potentially new booster. Related question, do you think we have some protection now, even though the last booster was in October? I think you told someone that if they had three shots, they're pretty well protected, but not sure. Okay. No, this is great. And repetition is, is important here. So, um, you know, Vince and I have been talking for a while about, you know, what, what are we trying to achieve with these vaccines? What do, what do we try to achieve with vaccines in general? And it's protection against disease, right? We've talked to polio is the great model, right? That injected polio vaccine does not protect you against infection. It certainly does a great job of protecting folks against disease, the disease polio with the paralysis. So, we are continuing to see um, durable protection against um, disease. 
with those three shots. Um, and then the question comes is, you know, can we get some sort of um, enhancement above that, some kind of boost? Um, and there's a lot of a lot of studies trying to look at monovalent versus bivalent. I have to say, um, there was one that I just recently was looking at, didn't end up including because I think it was flawed by sort of a time bias issue, right? Because as time goes by. Um, also, there's an issue, as we've talked about, with if you're going to get those boosted mucosal antibodies neutralizing antibodies, reduce your risk of infection um, for maybe three or four months. And that study was looking at really it was the peak was two to four weeks and that really quickly dropped off after that boost. So, you know, in a situation like you're describing, um, at this point, most of us are saying if you've already gotten your your primary series, which would be three shots in most people's mind, um, then wait till October, November. If you're in a higher risk group, it probably makes sense to get that three to four month boost extra protection. Um, it's probably not going to be something everyone needs to do, um, but yeah, I I would I would recommend waiting at this point. And have a plan, right, Daniel? Well, that's probably the most important, right? You, you've already really gotten that 90% out of your vaccine. Well, let's get another 90% out of appropriate early treatment. Susan writes, a man who is physically fit, just turning 70, went to the hospital at the end of last week with atrial fibrillation after having exerted himself riding a bicycle in the heat and humidity. There's a family history of heart problems. He was treated with Cardizem, a beta block, and a beta blocker, put in Eliquis after scans, et cetera. Finally treated with electric shock therapy on Monday, went home Tuesday, tested positive for COVID-19, called the cardiologist, was told to consist, continue existing medicines and not add Paxlovid in view of the fact that the electric shock treatment can be followed by blood clots being thrown out of the house, out of the heart, is that's the right path? You know, I think the the interesting thing there is, okay, so you called the cardiologist and he told you to what to do about your cardiac problems, but COVID is not a cardiology issue. So call your infectious disease doctor, call your primary doctor who might then reach out to an infectious disease doctor. So yeah, don't call me for management of your AFib and don't call the cardiologist for management of your COVID-19. Amy writes, my dad is still experiencing brain fog and fatigue after acquiring his second COVID infection about three plus months ago. I encouraged him to go to a clinic that specializes in long COVID in his area. He wasn't satisfied that they just told him his blood work indicated that he has a lot of inflammation in his body. He wants to do this commercial long haulers test that seems pretty sketchy to me covidlonghaulers.com. I'm not aware of a validated long COVID test, and I have a feeling they just want to sell them on the treatment, which I don't fully understand, even after perusing their websites. What do you think of these types of tests? Are they legit? Yeah, they're not. Um, you know, it is tough. Maybe that'll generate some hate mail there. Um, but come on, there's a lot of a lot of snake oil salesmen out there, people that are, you know, willing to take your money. I and mean, we actually had an issue when we were trying to identify which are the centers of excellence for long COVID. And we asked a really simple question is just show us some metric by which you're making people better um, above just the natural history of people that recover over time. Um couldn't really see that. Um, so yeah, this this is tough when, you know, they, they want to take your money and, and do some panel and then hopefully they're, you know, not going to take more of your money, but that is often what that leads to. And separately, a neighbor takes hyaluronic acid for inflammation reduction. Is that something that could be effective for long COVID? Yeah. I mean, if anything, there's so many questions. So, you know, anyone who knows the answer to that, um, they, they, they probably are just making it up. We don't know. There's a lot of different things that people are trying, but we really need the science. We really need the controlled trials. Um, if I say it works, you might get a placebo effect, but that's not what we're after. We want stuff that actually works. All right, we'll end up with a polio question. Francis <laughs> writes, I received the original polio vaccine, three injections back in the 50s. Wow, that would be IPV. Since I am a registered nurse, over the years, I received boosters with the oral vaccine. Last booster was over 10 years ago. Now I am 76 years old, work per diem infusing home care patients. Should I receive another booster? If yes, the injection or oral vaccine? <laughs> I think you're set. I think you're done. Vincent, any thoughts? No, she's done and she she can only yeah. get the injected, right, in the U.S. We don't give the uh, OPV anymore. But no, 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 don't need any more. You're absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> 
That's TWIV Weekly Clinical Update with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone, be safe.